I want to be uh, somehow your guide, in some sense, a touristic guide through the journey I did uh, using partial differential equations. And uh, through the journey I did during my last, uh, say, 20, 25 years working in this uh, subject of trying to connect from microscopic uh, systems to microscopic systems or to microscale description of uh, large uh, particle uh, systems to kind of continuum descriptions of those uh, systems, okay? So in fact, uh, the uh, outline of the talk is the following. First, I would like to show you some scientific, technological, and uh, biological areas in which you find this question of describing a large system of particles. Let's say the overall behavior, the collective behavior of a large number of particles. We will see what it means particles later on. And the idea would be to try to uh, bridge the gap between the microscopic description you do of those systems to sign of continued descriptions based on average quantities like density, density of particles, say. Typically, you would be interested on that. So that's the first part. Then there will be uh, some uh, partial differential equations, and it uh, appears in my title, which I will try to explain you what are some of the basic type of equations we deal with, mainly uh, Vlasov and Boltzmann-like equations. We'll see what it means later on. And then that, uh, I will just give you a bit of an idea of how to connect uh, to other kind of models in which you have just equation for average quantities. Okay. So, first of all, in fact, what I want to do is to thank people. So I want to thank uh, all my collaborators, postdocs, and PhD students. That's the first thing I want to do. For all the uh, years of uh, interesting collaborations and discussion, it was a pleasure to work with people. And especially, uh, I really enjoy that part of our research, which is to uh, teach other people uh, techniques that you have learned and uh, do uh, and solve problems on the blackboard with uh, people from any cultural background using mathematics. So first of all, thanks. So thank you, Eva. I don't know if I'm going to be able to solve x equals s plus 1 today, but uh, certainly I'll show you something more difficult. OK. So thank you to the family, too, for all the support. Well, so the first thing I want to do is to give you an idea of, in one example, of the kind of questions you are interested in. So I'm going to start by just taking this balloon over here. OK, so I have this balloon. And we know that, well, if we put a finger on the balloon, we have some force that repels this finger and tries to yes, recover the, the shape. And this is what we call the pressure. OK, but we have uh, understood that uh, after many years that this pressure is due somehow to the continuous bouncing of many, many balls, which are the gas molecules that bounces against the surface of the balloon and produce this average force. So somehow the pressure will be the microscopic uh, uh, quantity, the average quantity, that you would like to explain based on simple rules that in that case are the gas molecules that uh, compose the gas. So here you have, in fact, one of the technological applications that uh, I learned that these kind of models had when I started in, uh, in this profession 20 years ago. They were interested in computing accurately the uh, thermal, uh, the temperature uh, feel around the uh, a spaceship. I mean, when you had the reentry of the spaceship in the upper layers uh, uh, of the atmosphere. So typically, it produces a big compression of the gas, and then obviously gives to a uh, it leads to a huge change of uh, certain quantities, like temperature or density, around it. And uh, of course, we are very interested in knowing accurately how to uh, compute the temperature. That uh, would be, in this case, the average quantity, uh, for obvious reasons, to avoid some accidents that we all know happened in the past. Okay? So this is, uh, in fact, one application of uh, the most classical example of kinetic theory, and I will come back later on to that. Let me now uh, show you um, some example related to uh, granular media. So this is an experiment that the first time I saw the experiment on live when, when I was a postdoc in Austin in 1998 in the uh, lab of Sweeney. 
And uh, in fact, this is, uh, comes from Aronson that uh, allowed me to use his uh, video from the Argonne National Labs. So what you are doing here is to uh, um, vertically oscillate a very thin layer of granular beads. And then if you do it uh, that uh, with a certain, uh, then, uh, with a certain <coughs> frequency and uh, amplitude, then you get the formation of these standing patterns that gives you, uh, this is a kind of hexagonal pattern that gives you, uh, and you can classify all the patterns that you get, in fact. Here you have some kind of uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, version of this experiment, in which you have some molecular dynamic simulation, and here you have this uh, solution of certain complicated PDEs that appear there, that I will discuss later on. And the idea is that by solving uh, those PDEs, you can somehow recover the uh, the behavior of the uh, periodic solution that you get for the density. Okay, so this is another example of uh, how to describe a microscopic, uh, uh, a large uh, a system uh, composed of a large number of particles based on simple ideas. The simple ideas uh, at the microscopic level means that when the particles collide, you just assume that they lose part of their kinetic energy. In this case, you have some kind of inelastic collision. Okay. Yes, so let me show you some more example. Here is another example that in which I also worked some years ago. And uh, it's a bit different to what uh, we saw before. Here is uh, what you wanna do is to describe the transport of, uh, charge, uh, of charged particles into a semiconductor material. Here you have the evolution of the density of particles in one typical device, this is called a MESFET. And um, here the big difference with respect to the previous two cases is that on top of the possible interactions that there could be between, let's say, the electrons, what you're assuming is an interaction of the electrons through some kind of mean field force that they produce, okay? The, the electric, uh, electrostatic force. So then you have on top this uh, issue. Uh, in fact, let me mention here that, as you see, you have some convergence towards some stationary states. And this, uh, here you have a simulation of um, uh, a solution of some PD that is behind this. And what you see is when the time uh, goes to infinity, essentially you arrive also in certain variables, uh, here position and velocity, to some steady state. So one of the questions he, uh, that uh, show up naturally in this kind of problems is to estimate, well, to see the, the, the trend of convergence towards a stationary state and to estimate the rate of convergence. Uh, because you want to know that uh, this happens in, uh, in a certain time, which is reasonable to what uh, you, you want to use then later on this kind of devices. So this is another example. Let me give you now an example in a biological area which I also work a little bit, which is the, when you want to describe the um, collective movement of a huge number of cells, which they uh, direct uh, uh, their movement towards the source of certain chemical substance. This is cell movement by chemotaxis. Here you have it in a movie from Sun Open Source uh, Journal that I found, which you see uh, how uh, using, I mean, just a kind of pipette in which uh, you put some chemoattractant, you see how the cells, they just direct their movement towards the source of that uh, chemical, okay? So the idea would be to try to, uh, again, you have plenty of them, it's not that you are gonna have five or six like uh, appeared in the movie, but you have uh, many of them and you want to see if you can recover some idea about the behavior of this uh, density of those cells. And now, finally, I arrive to uh, the one that I have used for, uh, let's say, to um, organize a bit the talk. This uh, is the sample of uh, swarming, which is a bit bu bucolic or idyllic, if you want. Uh, it's nice to see uh, these kind of uh, large uh, structures that appear in, uh, for in uh, the collective behavior of many uh, different species. So for instance, here you have fish shoals or uh, 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 flocks of starlings, and the, uh, again, uh, the idea here is um, 
that you want to describe the formation of this large structure based on simple rules that you assume for the interaction between the individuals. Okay? So by the way, this is a home video that you can find many of them uh, about uh, the formation of these uh, star, uh, flocks of star, uh, starlings in, an, in a place that uh, you can, most of you probably recognize, which is in Brighton. And um, so the idea would be, can you uh, uh, explain the formation of this large coherent structure based, for instance, in uh, basic uh, effects like attraction, uh, that because uh, they, they, these individuals want to be too uh, close to each other, some inner repulsion because they don't want to be too close, in fact, and some other effects. So what I wanted to do in this first part is to show you different uh, cases that I, in which I have worked uh, during uh, these last uh, 22 years, always with this kind of um, this kind of uh, uh, approach for the modeling. So, okay. So, in fact, uh, all of them, in fact, are connected to more or less the same, uh, the same strategy of modeling. And it's connected, uh, especially the first one, to what uh, is the classical Hilbert 6 problem. I'll come back in a second. So what's the common point? Because uh, now, at this point, you will be thinking, well, this guy is telling me uh, that uh, I can do that and that. There are so many different things. What uh, is the common point? So the common point is that we want to explain an interaction between many particles, between a, uh, between a large number of particles. Particles between quotes because the particles are different in each of the subjects. So in the case of rarefied gases, which is the classical one, we will be talking about gas molecules. In the case of the granular media that I show you, I will be talking about the glass beads that form uh, this uh, thin layer of, uh, of uh, grains. In semiconductors, we are talking about the behavior of electrons or, or holes. In chemotaxis, it will be cells or bacteria. Or in the last uh, example I show you, where animals, group of individuals, I mean, you can talk about LS and so on. There are plenty of other applications you can do in uh, plasmas, in astrophysics, in economy, in neuroscience, and the particle, the meaning of particle changes from one to the other. But the common point is how to extract a kind of uh, uh, common, uh, well, a, a kind of uh, continuum description based on the assumptions on the microscopic uh, model for the particles. Okay, so I want just to mention that somehow this, in the classical, in the most classical case, is uh, related to the Hilbert 6 problem, as is uh, usually uh, referred, which um, uh, he posed the question in the International Congress of Mathematicians at the beginning of the 20th century if we were able to connect the fundamental equations of fluid mechanics or derive the fundamental equation of fluid mechanics from a microscopic model uh, based on Newton's law. So here we have uh, two of my gods, okay? And uh, the question is, can we connect them? Can we connect uh, fluid mechanics from Newton or obtain fluid mechanics from uh, Newton's law? So in fact, this is a problem that uh, has been advanced a lot uh, lately by uh, the French school. Uh, and. Uh, in the, in the classical setting, but it's not uh, the point to discuss uh, 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 these things right now. But uh, this is more related, and uh, we will see later on, to the first application, the application in uh, ratified gases. Okay, so now let's recapitulate what are the key ingredients. Um, the first thing is, or the first uh, point in the strategy is that you have to forget about trying to follow the movement of each single particle. So it's almost impossible if we think about the case of the gas that we are able to follow the path of each single molecule of the gas. So because you have 10 to the 23 essentially even in very tiny portions of the gas. So you forget about this. Instead, you go to a kind of a statistical description. So. The statistical description means that now you forget about that the particles are located in certain position, certain velocity, but there is a probability of finding them at certain position and certain velocity. 
So you have a probability density on what is called the phase space in X and V. And in fact, uh, this idea was introduced by Maxwell already at the uh, middle of the 19th century, in which he proposed how to um, uh, describe thermal equilibrium based on uh, the Gaussian. By the way, in kinetic theory, the Gaussian is usually called the Maxwellian, not the Gaussian, because it was the, the uh, description, the uh, <coughs> probability density for thermal equilibrium. Okay, so, and out of that, once you know, if you are able to know an evolution for F, you want to find uh, macroscopic quantities. And what are some of the macroscopic quantities that you are interested in? So one of them, obviously, is density of particles. You are interested in knowing some law or some evolution about number density in position. Then you are also interested in, in knowing what is, what is the mean velocity, which will correspond just to the average in velocity of the distribution function. And finally, maybe you are interested also in fluctuations around the mean velocity, which will lead you to uh, the concept of temperature. And in fact, fluctuations around the mean velocity will lead you away of, this, of describing also the pressure. So these are just a sample of macroscopic quantities for which you uh, would like to obtain some uh, evolution based on assumptions or based on certain properties of the evolution of F depending on the kind of problem that we are interested in. Okay, so now let me uh, show you our, uh, uh, two examples. One of them uh, will do it uh, in the application of swarming, just because I put a bit of more emphasis on that. I think it's a little bit nicer for such a talk. And then I will come back to the case, uh, the classical case of gas molecules. So the idea is first, you're gonna derive an evolution equation not for the average quantities, but for this middle ground, for this probability density in phase space. You're gonna derive something for the evolution of F, okay? How do you derive that from the M particle system? So in fact, let me just give you a very simple sample, so some little math here. So you take just the motion of one particle, which is subject to a given force, then you write Newton's law. You write it as a system, put some initial conditions, okay? Very good, so x dot equals v, v dot equals f. You have some initial conditions, so then you know perfectly how to find, well, you know that you have, in principle, a solution of that. Okay, but assume that now you don't know the position and the velocity of the initial particle with precision, but you know just the probability of finding that particle at a certain position x and a certain velocity v. How do you find the law, the evolution of f, so the idea is yes, you're gonna transfer the probability in time. So in fact, what uh, you assume is that the probability is transported through that characteristics. In this way, you get what is called the Vlasov equation, okay? But this is just for one single particle. Now, what, really do, uh, what do, uh, do you do when you have uh, many, many, many particles? Let's say you have and interacting particles. Okay, so in this case, so let's do it in, uh, in uh, the particular example of the uh, um, uh, swarming, uh, of, I mean, some models for swarming. In fact, this particular individual-based model, uh, I started to work on it when I was uh, in a sabbatical uh, year at uh, UCLA in 2008. I started to discuss with this group of people around uh, Andrea Bertozzi, uh, Maria Rita Dorsonia, and then they have, for instance, this very uh, simple looking uh, model in which you have just a kind of Newton's law for the evolution of M particles. You introduce this effect of the uh, repulsion for short distances and attraction for large distances by, uh, via this pairwise potential, U, that you assume is radial. And I just assume that the shape of the potential is, uh, is of this form, so it's decreasing for uh, short distances, increasing uh, for R, uh, e, uh, large enough. 
So this means that it's uh, exactly repulsive for short distances and attractive for large distances. And apart from that, you uh, add this term, which is only uh, purpose, is to fix an asymptotic speed for the particles. So the idea is that if there were no other effect here, the particle will just move with velocity, with the speed, sorry, square root out over beta. Okay? So this is essentially what I just said. And this is a particular example of a potential of that form. Okay? You can cook it up by, say, uh, exponentially decreasing functions of the radios with uh, certain constants, well chosen constants. Okay. So the interesting thing about such a simple sample is that you have very interesting patterns that appear in the numerical simulation of this set of ODs. So this was already uh, uh, <clears throat> obtained by the group at UCLA, and we have studied this recently with some postdocs in the department. And um, here you have two, well, two simulations with, uh, let's say, 200 particles. And uh, here you will see that uh, after um, a few time, they organize, they agree <coughs> in moving in certain direction. So this is what uh, we call the flock pattern. Here the center of mass of the simulation is taken away, so uh, the window is just centered around it. This will be moving translationally in this direction. Okay? So they agree into some spatial profile, then they move into certain direction. While here, you see, it's, it seems uh, right now for a long time a little bit chaotic, but at some point they will uh, organized and they will arrange in such a way that in fact they rotate and they go around certain location and leads to this uh, uh, single mill pattern that now is showing up. Okay? So the question is uh, again how can you uh, describe this kind of uh, large patterns or large structures just based for instance in uh, the microscopic rules that you imposed and The initial conditions and parameters. The parameters on the potential, like C's and L's. You can have both of them with the same parameters even, depending on the initial condition. Yes, yes. Yes, correct. So again, uh, the, the question is, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, how can you explain this uh, in based of, well, based on uh, some microscopic model? Uh, sorry, uh, more continuum model. Good. So now let me explain to you just a little bit the idea how to obtain a continuum Blasov-like equation from the particle system. In just a, a little bit of the idea, I think is uh, just uh, uh, interesting to uh, see uh, uh, the intuition. So what I'm going to do is the following. Okay, I have this system of n particles. I have the two terms that I just mentioned before. I know how to solve it, I know how to obtain those paths. So with them, in fact, what I'm going to do is to construct a probability measure. A probability measure that tells me, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, in this case, in a deterministic way, where the particles are at each time. Because what I'm going to do is construct what is called empirical measure, which is a Dirac delta at each location. Location means xit, vit. So this means that with probability one, over n, or some mass, let's say all of the particles, they have uh, the same uh, uh, weight here, one over n, I will be located in that position. So in fact, what you can check is that this kind of, uh, of, um, of measure, of probability measure, is a solution of certain uh, PD in some sense. And by uh, trying to approximate with many particles continuum densities, then you are able to extract the continuum model. This is what is called the mean field limit. In fact, in the mean field limit, the mean field Blasov equation, what you obtain is a Blasov equation like the one that I showed you before for one single particle. I have the extra term due to the asymptotic fixed speed uh, here. But the big difference is that the force field is now obtained from the density of particles. So now it's nonlinear. So uh, here it becomes the nonlinear Blasov, and I have this 
convolution of the gradient of the potential with the density of particles. So the density of particles, I remind you that consists only of integrating the velocity, uh, sorry, the distribution in phase space with respect to uh, velocity. So this is just a way of seeing how to get this kind of uh, kinetic equations in the middle. Um, let me mention here that uh, probably at this point I will mention some of the difficulties of this kinetic modeling. One of the difficulties is that this equation leads in a very high dimensional space. If we were talking about in three dimensions, we are talking about an evolution in six dimensions. So it seems that we are changing something which is in particles, which is very complicated to solve, uh, even if n is large, but it's something also very complicated because it's an evolution in six dimensions. But as I told you, you can use it as a kind of middle ground, and this I will show you later on in this part of the talk. Okay, so a couple of more comments. Some variations of this equation, which uh, sometimes are very interesting, is if you add noise, you can add noise, and uh, in this uh, kind of uh, second order, I mean, Newton's uh, like uh, models, even with the interactions. And then instead of a blast of uh, equation like the one I showed you before, the difference is that you will obtain something with a sun operator in the right hand side that takes uh, into account the dissipation that you have in the system due to the interaction of the particles with the medium. Let's say that you have particles in a fluid or something like this. So that is a, a, another model which uh, I will make some comments later. Okay, now let me uh, show you just a bit about other family of equations which are quite important in kinetic theory and allows you to do this uh, bridging of the scales from micro to maker. And I'm talking now about the most classical application of kinetic theory. So let's talk about rarefied gases. So assume that you have this uh, uh, gas, that is a monoatomic, so you have only one kind of molecules in the gas. So we have this huge billion. We assume that we have a huge billion of many, many, many particles, 10 to the 20 to, the, I don't know how many more. And uh, then uh, they are just interact, colliding, really colliding like hard spheres, and bouncing in an elastic way. So we have this huge billion, okay? So the first thing that you can do is, in fact, uh, parameterize the collisions that uh, you have in terms of, uh, well, it's not too important that you understand that scheme, but the idea is that you will have two particles coming with two velocities. They will collide. After the elastic collision, you are able to compute the velocities of the outgoing particles as soon as you know the direction in which they are colliding. So you can parameterize all the possible collisions in terms of one vector in the sphere, which tells you the direction in which they are colliding. You can do that in many ways, by the way. And one way you write the post-collision of velocities in terms of the pre-collision of velocities like this. And in fact, here I show you uh, Boltzmann. Uh, and Boltzmann had a very good idea, to, uh, well, many good ideas, in fact. But uh, one of them was how to do the right limit to get some equation for the evolution of uh, the probability uh, density in phase space. Well, here I showed you Boltzmann when probably he was very young, very motivated, just arrived to the department, having a lot of uh, energy and wanted to have uh, good PhD students and postdocs. Okay. Um, so he had the idea that uh, the good uh, limit to do when uh, n, the number of particles, goes to infinity, is to do a limit in which the gas is ratified, there are few particles. To say that there are few particles is to say that the radius of each of the particles, each of the balls, is going to zero. And you're assuming also some scaling relation between the number of particles going to infinity and the radius goes to zero, which is that n times r squared goes to one. That's what is called by now the boltzmann grad limit. He made several assumptions about the uh, collisions. He assumed that uh, the collisions are localized in time and space. He assumed that uh, the collisions are elastic. And uh, probably one of the most important assumptions he did, it was the assumption of molecular chaos. Molecular chaos means that the particles are, um, they are for, keep forgetting 
their memory. Each time that they collide, immediately after the collision, they don't remember that they already collide. And they continue keeping colliding without reminding what they, that they collide in the past. Okay? Probably saying like some of our students after the exam. They will never remember. Um, so the question is that he was able to obtain an evolution equation for the uh, uh, and the data assumption of the uh, probability density of the uh, molecules. And he wrote this equation, that there's his name, in which you have free transport, because uh, if there are no collision between the particles, the particles just follow x dot equals v, v dot equals zero. And that uh, you have a very complicated operator, don't look at it even. That uh, operator on the right hand side, which is very ugly, it just takes uh, into account the fact that uh, there are particles that due to a collision uh, ceases to have velocity v, so you have a loss, and there are particles that due to a collision uh, they move with velocity v and you have a gain. Okay, very good. So in fact, this was the first, one of the first success uh, of uh, Boltzmann because what he proved is that the collision operator uh, if you look for a stationary states of this equation, the collision operator in the kernel leads you to all the Maxwellian equilibria, to the thermal equilibrium that Maxwell already proposed some years before. Okay? We have to remember that Maxwell even wrote the collision operator in a weak form. You write, go to the original uh, work of Maxwell, you can find the Boltzmann operator written in that form, acting on test functions. So, I mean, the big, uh, uh, the big uh, um, um, success of Boltzmann was to get first tests. And also, the second thing that he was able to do is to find what is called the Boltzmann H theorem. The Boltzmann H theorem um, tells you that you have some, a certain quantity, which is the double integral of x log f, which plays an important role. But before explaining the important role, let me tell you something. Here I have again Boltzmann, okay? He looks angry and upset. No, no, no. It's not because uh, he went uh, to many committees, panels, hiring committees. I don't know. No, no, it's not the reason. Not even being the director of the undergraduate studies. Sorry, Jonathan. Okay? <laughs> the reason, the real reason was that he made a very good result. That he was upset. <coughs> Why? Well, the story is the following. He proved that uh, the uh, entropy of the system decays. So it's a Lyapunov function for the equation. So this means that the derivative in time of the functional actor and the distribution function decays. So there is a dissipation into the system. And he was very happy to say that this will lead you to uh, possibly convergence toward local equilibrium or global equilibrium that it hasn't been proved until very recently based on uh, this horrible expression of the dissipation that you don't have to even look at it. Okay, but why he was uh, upset? Because essentially this means that uh, you are obtaining a system which leads to irreversible dynamics obtained from a system of particles which have reversible dyna dynamics. And this fact gave him a very hard time. He was uh, really a... Uh, 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 he was uh, dismissed by many other colleagues at that time and many other mathematicians because they didn't believe that you could do that. Okay, and he had a bad time. So that was a real reason. Okay, so this to tell you that uh, you can get by doing uh, some of, uh, of these uh, uh, limits and going to infinity, you can get even system in which you have some dissipation. Like it was uh, the Boltzmann equation is one of the first examples. In fact, for the rigorous validation of the Boltzmann equation, there is a very hard open problem. It's a very hard and open problem in kinetic theory. There is only derivations for very particular cases, in a rigorous way by Langford in the 70s. Okay, and I'm almost now uh, in the next uh, thing I want to tell you, which is. I told you before, the kinetic equation seems already too complicated because I'm going to a very high dimensional problem. And now, I mean, we all know about the fluid equations. I mean, we are much more accustomed to deal with uh, earlier equations, Navier-Stokes equations. So how can we do the connection between them? 
or also you want you uh, want to describe the uh, diffusion or heat flow, you are much more in the, uh, accustomed to the heat equation or to some nonlinear diffusion equation. So how can you connect these two worlds? So there are two ways of doing that. Uh, the first one is um, to do some time space scaling. Uh, and here you have a picture about or a scheme about the idea of looking at the system at different times uh, and, and as position uh, scales. So say that we, uh, we uh, look at the microscopic version like uh, in terms of Newton's law. Here we were looking at uh, some already uh, average, I mean uh, middle uh, ground uh, description based on this kinetic uh, modeling. And now we would like even to go to a more larger picture so we want to see the problem for a much more distance and go to a kind of diffusive scale. So one of the possibilities is to do this kind of asymptotic limits. And, one, and uh, one of the samples is the diffusion approximation. I want to just explain to you a little bit about this. Um, so in the diffusion approximation, by doing this uh, uh, time uh, and spatial and velocity change of variables, you make appear some dimensionless version of your system in which you have a small parameter. So I am just showing you this in the case of the linear blaso fokker plan equation. Assume that f is given, it's the force field. You have some operator that drives you to equilibrium. Remember, equilibrium means that when t goes to infinity, we see this convergence towards some particular distribution in, uh, uh, in uh, this case, in velocity, okay? And assume that when you do this dimensionless version, you end up with these uh, small parameters here and there with the corresponding powers. So this means that essentially the, uh, uh, um, the strongest uh, term here, or the term of the, uh, the higher order term in this equation is the Q operator, this operator over here, okay? So already Hilbert, and I think he's human, that's why he proposed that as a problem, because probably he was already thinking how to do. Um, so he proposed a way of uh, finding some, uh, a, for, a formal um, approach to finding uh, an approximation for epsilon as small of the distribution function. This uh, bears his name, Hilbert's function. You look for an expansion in terms of the small parameter. And in fact, I don't want to bother you with this too much. In fact, I thought, uh, I think uh, I will skip uh, a couple of lines here. The important thing is that you can uh, compute very easily uh, what happens with the zero order. The zero order means that you are in the kernel of that operator that you can solve. In that particular case, it's much easier than for the Boltzmann equation. It only depends on one degree of freedom, which is the density of particles and the rest are given, are fixed, velocity zero and temperature given by a constant. And then you can compute an equation for the evolution of rho tx. So our objective now is to find an equation for rho tx. So in fact, by, by uh, uh, taking the uh, terms in the equation of the different orders and doing some manipulations that I want to skip, I want to go to the last uh, line here then you end up in a closed equation for the evolution of the density. That equation bears the name of drift diffusion Poisson, and is one of, well, drift diffusion, sorry, that's it, in which you have an, a linear diffusion term, which is the Laplacian of rho times temperature. Temperature here is just a constant, and some drift, which is given by the force field, F, okay? In fact, this equation is another of the equations that in this journey I'm showing you play a role in my uh, scientific life. And uh, let me mention that these three diffusion-like equations uh, have been very important in many of the applications that I told you at the beginning. Probably the one that is the most classical one is in semiconductors. It was used even in uh, commercial softwares. Um, uh, in the um, Institute for Microelectronics in Vienna. And there are particular cases that, um, as I said, uh, played some important role in, uh, in, uh, in the last years of my uh, 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 scientific uh, career. 
One of them is the Keller-Siegel model for chemotaxis, which uh, looks uh, is of the, ser of the same type. It's a three diffusion equation, okay, of that form, in which now you have the evolution of the density of, in that case, represents cells. And uh, now the drift is called uh, the drift diffusion Poisson because the uh, drift is obtained from solving a Poisson equation. So that's a one particular example of this family which uh, plays an important role. And in fact, you have plenty of them, plenty of them which I introduce in this very large family of equations that I call mckeen vlasov like equations, in which you have a nonlinear diffusion term, say like uh, Laplacian of rho to the m, and uh, some uh, nonlinear drift term, which you have rho times a force field, and the force field is computed again like a convolution with the gradient of a potential. So they include plenty of the macroscopic models that you can derive in many of the applications before. And uh, this family of equations are very interesting because they, uh, they get uh, inside many different phenomena, like the ones that I'm showing you here, in which um, you have this uh, tendency, as I said, in, the, in all the cases of convergence towards the equilibrium. The equilibrium here will be this uh, bump at the middle. But you saw that in the meantime, by converging towards equilibrium, you have, let's uh, do it again, you have this kind of uh, concentration onto some points. Eventually, the concentration on those points, they, uh, they uh, like, uh, know that uh, they are not alone and that uh, there are somebody else somewhere else and then they emerge into a single bump. So there are kind of some metastability uh, behavior here. So in fact, one of the main questions in this kind of models is to know what are the stationary states? What is the rate of convergence towards steady states? So how fast you go? And, um, and um, the uh, possible transition uh, uh, behaviors that you may have towards these um, uh, uh, convergence towards the state state. Okay, so in fact I want just to say that um, here you connect with a whole bunch of different mathematical techniques which are uh, very important uh, to study the rate of convergence of these kind of equations and I want just to mention two things. First one, that those systems uh, share with the Boltzmann equation one thing that they dissipate some functional, okay? So there is some function, which is, uh, in that case, is this one, where, uh, for which you can check, I will not show you the other two lines, you can check that this functional is dissipated along the flow. The fact that it's dissipated along the flow then gives you techniques to attack the two questions I mentioned, finding the stationary states, which are stable, I'm finding how fast you converge towards them. In fact, this uh, leads to a whole bunch of uh, different mathematics that uh, you can see, for instance, in the very particular case of just nonlinear diffusion. So I want to mention this particular case because it, it really made a difference in my, in my scientific life some years ago. Uh, since even so, uh, it looks a very simple model, it contains a lot of different uh, phenomena which are very nice, interesting, and uh, you can use it as a showcase for many, many different techniques. So in fact, here uh, for this nonlinear diffusion, you have a particular solution which gives you the overall behavior of the system, which is a self-similar solution. It's not a stationary solution in that case. In the right, uh, in the right uh, scaling, you have a stationary solution. It's not too important about that, you have just a convergence towards some profile that diffuses in time. The important thing is that you can, as I said, you can use it to check your mathematical techniques if you are able to really prove that you have that stationary state as a unique one and you have convergence towards the stationary state and how fast. And this uh, open a lot of uh, different connections between different fields of mathematical analysis that I am very proud to have participated in. 
uh, co uh, connections between functional inequalities, the entropy method, and uh, the systems of those uh, uh, entropy uh, functions. Okay? So, I think now I've shown you one possibility of getting equations for macroscopic average quantities. That part was for the density of particles. And I want to finish my talk by showing you uh, the other uh, classical way of uh, getting macroscopic equations is by writing some equations for other average quantities like mean velocity or temperature, which is usually called the hydrodynamic limit. And I want just to mention the classical, the very, very classical case of the Boltzmann equation. If we come back for the, uh, to the problem of rarefied uh, gases, and we just write again a dimensionless version, version of the Boltzmann equation, you make appear again a small parameter, which usually is called the Knudsen number, the equivalent of the Reynolds number for Van Nuys dogs. This is the epsilon there. <coughs> and then you can uh, check that, in fact, when, uh, well, the first thing is that when epsilon gets small, you expect to, be, uh, to have F epsilon getting closer and closer to a member of the kernel of Q. So in the kernel of the operator, remember, it, they were all the thermal equilibriums uh, found by Maxwell. So you expect F epsilon to be closer and closer to a Maxwellian with uh, mean velocity U, temperature theta, and some number density in rho. If you compute formally, then, the moments of this equation closing with the Maxwellian, you get the compressible Euler equations for a monoatomic gas. And this was another of the success, the successes of uh, Boltzmann at his, at his time. OK? So in fact, here you have, for instance, a simulation due to uh, uh, these people using Monte Carlo for different values of uh, epsilon. Uh, in which uh, you can uh, find, uh, you, you see how to go from the ratified regime to a more fluid-like regime when epsilon goes to zero, as I said. So, in fact, there is a lot of uh, uh, research in that direction, trying to uh, see what is really important, where to do uh, the kinetic uh, uh, simulation or the uh, continuous simulation. And as I said, just to finish, I want to again go back to my, uh, by, uh, to the uh, application in which I put probably more emphasis during my talk, swarming, in which uh, you can uh, use this kind of ideas to derive some macroscopic quantities for the evolution of the density of individuals and for the mean velocity, okay? So I'm not sh uh, showing you how I derive those equations, but I am showing you here that if you do that, and if you solve numerically now these equations that are there on the right, so uh, you get something that at least qualitatively looks similar. We didn't spend any time trying to make them uh, closer by choosing well the initial data or anything. What we are solving here on the left is the n-particle system with uh, some attraction, repulsion, and some additional force, by the way, that uh, keeps the particle near the origin. And on the right-hand side, we are solving the corresponding hydrodynamic equations with uh, some numerical method. And we see uh, this uh, qualitatively uh, good agreement between them. So this is just to tell you, try to convince you, that uh, the, uh, all the work that you did going from the n-particle system to the middle ground of the kinetic equation, and then doing some further analysis to get some macroscopic equations for average quantities, sometimes pays the, the effort. And uh, well, I hope to have convinced you along this journey that we took today, and uh, with this touristic uh, guide through some of the PDEs I was working in the last 20 years, that it's a lot of fun. At least I had it. So thank you very much.